There are lots of different microbes that can infect human beings and cause disease. Today we're going to focus on the prokaryotic causes of disease, namely the bacteria. We'll talk about different types of bacteria that can cause infections in humans as well as diseases that they cause. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about prokaryotic pathogens. Mostly, we'll be talking about bacteria, since those that is the domain of life that has at least the potential to infect and cause disease in human beings. Now, because prokaryotes represent two-thirds of the branches of life, two of the three domains are prokaryotic in nature, bacteria and archaea, we have to acknowledge the fact that the diversity among prokaryotes is as, as high or if not higher than the biodiversity among eukaryotes. Now the good news is this, 99% of all prokaryotic species can't even be cultured in a laboratory simply because we can't replicate the environmental conditions and the nutritional requirements needed in order to grow those things. And as such, that whole 99% has no capacity to even bother to infect humans and cause disease. And of that remaining 1% that has the potential to cause human disease, the majority of them don't. Most prokaryotes are friendly. But today what we're going to focus on is the small proportion of prokaryotes, namely the bacteria that have the potential to either infect and cause disease in humans or can be used by humans to help prevent and treat diseases. As such, we're going to go through them according to the bacterial classification system. So we'll talk about them. Uh, we'll talk about a few groups of gram positive bacteria and some groups of gram negative bacteria and sort of break them down and discuss which members of these groups have the potential to infect and cause disease in humans, as well as which other ones may be actually helpful to humans. Maybe they're part of our normal microbiota, or they're able to help us uh, produce antibiotics to treat certain infections. Now, if we're going to talk about infectious diseases, first we should figure out where do these infectious microbes come from? Well, pathogens can come from lots of different places. Overwhelmingly, the majority of new infections that we see in human beings are considered to be zoonoses. Zoonoses are infections that are spread readily from animals to humans. And these could be diseases uh, such as Lyme disease or West Nile virus or rabies or the bubonic plague. All of these are diseases that are able to be spread from animals directly to humans. Now, not all animal infections can be permitted can be transmitted directly to humans. Sometimes animals can act as shelter species. Shelter species are different from zoonotic species in the fact that it, shelter species do not directly transmit diseases to humans. Instead, they act as a home where different microbes can get together and exchange genetic information or can be a spot where certain microbes can go from being non-pathogenic to pathogenic via evolution or they can be go, go from being slightly pathogenic to more pathogenic by acquiring new traits via HGT or again through evolution. So shelter species are another source or another potential source of either pathogenic bacteria or uh, a place where uh, pathogenic bacteria could become more pathogenic. Another place where microbes can interact and become more pathogenic or gain pathogenicity is in the environment. Remember that bacteria have been competing with each other for billions of years. And as such, they have found ways to interact with each other, to compete with each other, and, 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 and to evolve to be more resistant to each other's tricks. Well, some of these species have actually involved a form of chemical warfare. They produce chemicals that are toxic to the majority of other bacteria in their environment. Now, we have actually hijacked those bacteria and used those, that form of chemical warfare and refer to them as antibiotics. And these antibiotics are used uh, very commonly to treat many bacterial infections. But the thing you have to realize is this. That was an evolution, this is an ongoing evolutionary arms, world, arms race. So if certain microbes are developing chemical warfare and developing chemicals that can be used to, to destroy other bacteria and free up room in the environment for them, those other ones are going to respond by evolving ways of resisting those chemicals. They develop antibiotic resistance. So the thing we have to realize then is that those antibiotic resistance genes have often been found within the bacterial populations in which they exist for millions if not billions of years. It's only been recently in the past 80 years or so since humans began using antibiotics on a regular basis that we've been applying a large amount of net of selection pressure 
to those pathogenic species. And that selection pressure has ramped up the speed with which these antibiotic resistance genes are either evolving or being shared within or between bacterial species. So today, we're going to talk about the types of microbes that can either produce antibiotics or cause infections, and we'll break them down by the different groups. We'll start with the gram-positive bacteria and talk about two groups within the gram-positive uh, bacterial population. We'll talk about the Firmicutes and the Actinobacteria. So Firmicutes is a phylum of gram-positive bacteria that typically exists either as cocci, so the spherical-shaped bacteria, or as rods. They also include a small group of bacteria called the mycoplasmas, which are actually the smallest living organisms on the planet Earth. And these guys completely lack a cell wall and have an amoeboid shape. Um, but we'll talk more about them uh, towards the end. They've actually lost their cell wall through, uh, through reductive evolution. It's kind of cool. We'll talk about them uh, at sort of the end of this section. So let's start with the, let's start with the gram-positive rods. So the gram-positive rods are broken down into uh, two major groups. Uh, you've got your bacillus and your clostridium. And we talk about these guys first, uh, both bacillus and clostridium, the majority of the members of these groups are able to form endospores. So uh, in a separate video, we talked about endospores. These are these highly, these are structures that are highly resistant to, uh, to chemical insults and, and the environment and basically allow bacteria to kind of live forever until they reach into a more favorable environment. So uh, most members of the genus bacillus and the genus clostridium are able to form endospores. Now, how do we differentiate between a bacillus and a clostridium? Well, bacilli uh, typically live in the, in the soil and they are most commonly aerobic organisms. Uh, they live best through respiration, so they want to be in the presence of oxygen. Uh, overwhelmingly, bacillus tends to be, tend to be friendly bacteria uh, and don't cause us much harm. Uh, there's a, one notable exception would be bacillus anthracis, which is the causative agent of anthrax. Um, that is a gram-positive spore-forming rod that can cause uh, illness in human beings. Obviously, anthrax is a, a, a pretty severe infection. On the other hand, clostridium, while also being found in soil as well as water, are anaerobic. They typically do not like oxygen, um, so they tend to spore, form endospores in oxygen-containing environments, which is where we typically contract them. But once they get in your body, uh, they want to end up in deep in your tissues or in your gut, which are anaerobic environments. They will then... Uh, germinate from their endospores and then they can cause um, cause infections as well. Uh, very common causes of infection in the world of clostridium. Uh, you're going to have clostridium botulinum which causes botulism, clostridium tetani which causes tetanus, and clostridium difficile uh, which causes a C. diff infection which uh, largely infects the intestines and all three of those can potentially be fatal. Now those are the two major groups with Within uh, within the firmicutes that will cause uh, that will be able to form endospores. The rest of the guys we'll talk about will be gram positive, but they will not be able to form endospores. These include some gram positive rods like Lactobacillus, but also include some gram positive cocci like uh, Lactococcus and Enterococcus, which commonly live in our gut. The good news about Lactobacillus, Lactococcus, Enterococcus, these guys are all friendly bacteria. They're commonly part of our normal microbiota. They live in our gut, and they're actually, uh, you, you very commonly find them if you take probiotics, for example. Um, probiotics will often contain uh, one or more of the uh, species belonging to these to belonging to these genera, as they are important for your your gut health, um, resisting infection, as well as digesting your food. Some other members of the uh, of the Firmicutes that may not always be great uh, for you are the Staphylococcus and the Streptococcus. So we'll start with Staphylococcus. So Staphylococcus are gram positive cocci. Um, they form a colonial arrangement of irregular clusters of spherical bacteria. This is the result of incomplete separation during binary fission. Now, Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus contains um, a couple of species, uh, several species that are, are part of your normal microbiota. So uh, this will include things like Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Uh, these are commonly part of your normal microbiota, but understand that many of these Staphylococcus species are opportunistic pathogens. So for example, Staphylococcus epidermidis lives on your skin and it's perfectly fine if it's on your skin, but if it were to get inside of your body, it could cause lots of problems. Same thing with Staphylococcus saprophyticus, uh, part of your normal microbiota, but it's actually a pretty common cause of urinary tract infections. As long as it stays where it's supposed to and doesn't get into your urinary tract, you're fine. Now all of these staphylococcus are going to be facultative anaerobes. Uh, like I said, they're commonly found on your skin, but they can also be found in your gut and your oral and nasal mucosa. 
There is one really severe pathogen that we find um, in the group Staphylococcus, uh, that is Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus is a true pathogen, um, and it causes uh, skin infections um, such as uh, furuncles and boils. It can also cause necrotizing fasciitis. Um, but more importantly, if it makes it into your body, it can cause things like sepsis uh, and, and other major problems that are potentially fatal. Um, Staphylococcus aureus is actually the SA portion of MRSA or VERSA. So Staphylococcus aureus has shown the ability to develop uh, vast amounts of antibiotic resistance and as such is a, a, a real problem both inside hospitals and now outside hospitals as well as patients that prevent with staph present with Staphylococcus aureus infection. Um, there's a real chance that they may have a antibiotic resistant version of it um, and left untreated staphylococcus aureus can kill you in a number of different ways as i just described streptococcus is very similar also facultative anaerobes commonly found on the skin but also in the nasal oral mucosa um, and again contains groups that could be considered part of your normal microbiota slash opportunistic pathogens as well as true pathogens so for example about a third of us uh, have streptococcus pneumoniae somewhere in our oral nasal pharynx um, strep pneumo isn't that big of a deal if it stays where it's supposed to but when commonly what happens after acquiring another type of infection for example a cold or the flu uh, streptococcus pneumoniae can go where it shouldn't go uh, and get pushed into your oral nasal uh, get pushed up into your sinuses and cause a sinus infection down into your lungs to cause pneumonia or into your ears to cause an ear infection it can even cause meningitis um, in some cases as well which all uh, which could be potentially fatal strep mutans is also uh, a part of your normal microbiota found in most people's mouths and again while strep mutans is perfectly fine being there if you allow it to overgrow i.e poor dental hygiene um, you can end up getting cavities because strep mutans is the most prominent cause of, of uh, dental erosion uh, basically causing they're called dental caries uh, in the dental world but you know them as cavities on the other hand, there are some true pathogens in the, in the genus Streptococcus. Uh, Streptococcus pyogenes uh, probably is the most prominent. Um, Streptococcus pyogenes is a major cause of bacterial pharyngitis, which we commonly refer to as strep throat. So Streptococcus pyogenes is the strep in strep throat. But Streptococcus pyogenes can also cause endocarditis. It can also cause sepsis and impetigo, um, rheumatic fever, scarlet fever. Um, so lots of different infections depending on where the streptococcus pathogens finds itself. Bottom line is you don't want it in your body at all. It's not part of your normal microbiota. Another group uh, within the Firmicutes, uh, gram-positive rods uh, that are known as Listeria. So Listeria monocytogenes is probably the most prominent example um, from this particular genus. Um, Listeria monocytogenes is a gram-positive facultative anaerobe. It can't form an endospore like members of Bacillus or, or Clostridium can. One of the interesting things about Listeria monocytogenes is it can actually grow at low temperatures, uh, most notably like in your refrigerator. Um, and this is particular, particularly important because um, Listeria monocytogenes can cause a form of food poisoning um, if you ingest it in, in, in high enough abundance um, and in immunocompromised individuals this can actually uh, result in a form of, of meningitis which could be potentially fatal. Typically meningitis is not found in immune competent individuals uh, at least not that based on Listeria monocytogenes. The final group within Firmicutes I want to talk about are the mycoplasmas. So mycoplasmas are quite interesting. They're the smallest organisms on the planet Earth. Um, they are technically gram positive, but they lack that thick peptidoglycan cell wall that all gram positive uh, bacteria have. And that's because they've lost it through basically de-evolution. They had one and then they lost it. And now they exist as these cell wallless cells. Um, and one of the things that's neat is they can actually parasitize almost every known um, animal on the planet so they're they're like viruses in the sense that they are they there's one there's at least a species that can in fact impact almost any animal on the planet uh and they act as parasites uh that can harm them um in human beings uh there's one particular one uh that we focus on mycoplasma pneumoniae uh, which can cause pneumonia and meningitis and it's called mycoplasma pneumonia uh, when you contract it it's sort of rare but um can can cause a lot of problems in individuals that get it just like all pneumonia can so we'll wrap up our conversation about gram-positive bacteria by talking about the actinobacteria. We'll talk about three, uh, three genera within them. Uh, one of them is streptomyces. So streptomyces get their name from the fact that they actually grow 
uh, almost like a mold. They have that branching filamentous morphology when they grow, and they get the term myces, like mycelium, because of that fungal-like appearance when they grow. Um, there's over 500 known species of, of streptomyces, and they're perhaps the best studied group of bacteria on the planet Earth, with the main reason being is they're a tremendous source of antibiotics. Three quarters of all naturally occurring useful antibiotics actually come from this particular group of bacteria. These are things like streptomycin and neomycin and chloramphenicol. So one of the most widely used antibiotics uh, in, in modern medicine, as well as all of the derivatives, are the result of research done on streptomyces. So they're incredibly useful bacteria in, in terms of us, but they don't infect us, so that's nice. Uh, this group also includes the propione bacteria. Um, most notably in this group is propione bacterium acnes. Um, if you have currently are or like me had suffered from acne in the past, that's because of propione bacterium acnes, which lives in your, it lives on your skin um, and reproduces in your pores. And then uh, this actually causes um, those essentially my, small local infections that we call pimples. Um, and that's the result of propione bacterium acne's presence uh, on in, in our skin. The last group we'll talk about are the mycobacteria. So mycobacteria is this group of bacteria that produce these mycolic acid cell walls. Um, they're technically gram positive in terms of the fact that they have a single thick cell wall, but they have this they have this mycolic acid layer on the outside, um, which is incredibly waxy and makes them highly resistant to cellular defenses. It also makes them quite resistant to antibiotics. Um, which is why there has to be a special class of antibiotics specifically to target the pathogens within this particular group. Um, but it also makes it very hard for them to, to gather nutrients. Uh, so they grow quite slowly, whether it's in a host or whether it's uh, in a laboratory condition. Two most relevant species here are going to be Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes tuberculosis, and Mycobacterium leprae, which causes leprosy. Now we're gonna move on to the gram-negative world. And specifically, we're gonna be talking about the proteobacteria to start with. Um, these are actually, more specifically, we'll be talking about the enterobacteriaceae, um, which from the name of it, you may have already guessed, these are things that typically, at least in humans, are found inside of our gastrointestinal tract or enteric tract. Now, the thing about this is the majority of these guys are going to be gram-negative rods. We'll also encounter some vibrio, which are those comma-shaped um, bent rods, and some spirals, as well as some cocci. But because a lot of these guys look alike, the way we typically differentiate between them is by having to run biochemical tests to determine what their metabolic, what, what their metabolism um, can digest or what their metabolic output is, as well as looking for cell structures. Some of them are motile and can move, so they have flagella. Other ones are not motile and can't move, so they lack those flagella. So uh, very commonly, we have to do uh, several different tests during the, the last two eyes to figure out exactly what species we're dealing with. As I said, the majority of these guys are going to live either in our gut or our gastrointestinal tract um, with their preferred, uh, preferred environment being either the GI tract or in water. So the first species we'll talk about is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is a gram-negative rod um, that is found um, commonly on humans. Um, but one of the things that's interesting uh, about Pseudomonas aeruginosa is it endogenously like already comes with a high level of antibiotic resistance. And while normally it doesn't cause a major problem, if it finds itself inside the body, it can cause a host of problems. Um, one of the more common things it's known to cause is like surgical site infections. So you wanna keep it away from open wounds um, and inside your body, it can cause things like diarrhea and, and other major issues uh, if you were to acquire it. Um, like I said, uh, once you have an infection from Pseudomonas, it's often hard to treat because it has high levels of antibiotic resistance. It has multi-drug resistance. Uh, that's the, the term we typically use. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about Pseudomonas is if you grow it in a laboratory on like a Mueller Hinton plate, it'll grow this beautiful green color and has an odor that's actually kind of pleasant. It smells like grapes. Um, on the human body or when it's causing infections, not so good. But in a laboratory, it's actually kind of pleasant smelling and kind of pleasant to look at when you see it. Another highly pathogenic bacterium uh, that belongs to the Enterobacteriaceae group um, is Legionella pneumophila. So Legionella pneumophila is a gram-negative rod, um, but it exhibits something called pleomorphism. So while it's nominally a gram-negative rod, if you observe it in uh, like in culture, sometimes it looks like a rod, sometimes it looks like a coccobacillus, which is like a shortened rod, and other times you would swear that it's a coccus. Uh, so it can kind of change shapes a bit. Legionella pneumophila causes 
a disease called Legionnaire's disease. So uh, this is a particularly severe form of pneumonia. Um, but because Legionella pneumophila can actually, in, when, when the macrophages and other immune cells ingest it, they can't break it down. It has an intracellular lifestyle. lifestyle. It can actually spread throughout the body um, and the infection can then spread. And more importantly, it typically ends up in the bloodstream and kills its patients by causing sepsis. Um, this is called dissemination. And in general, in microbiology, dissemination is not a good term. It's okay to disseminate knowledge, but other than that, you don't want a disseminated infection. That's usually a bad thing. Uh, Legionella pneumophila is commonly found um, in freshwater, um, where it's typically acquired in cases of infection is from things like cooling towers, from uh, large AC units, uh, water towers, um, uh, on buildings in cities, uh, fountains, sprinkler heads, and things like that. So it's inhaled that way uh, and then causes a lung infection and then spreads outward from there. Another particularly unpleasant bacterium that belongs to this group is Yersinia pestis. Yersinia pestis might be perhaps the most famous bacterial killer of all. It is the causative agent of plague. Um, you've heard of the Black Death or the Black Plague. Yersinia pestis is the bacterium that causes that. And I say causes in present tense because people do still get the plague. Um, it's not in the epidemic or pandemic proportions that, that it was um, back in the 15 and 1600s, but people th to this day still acquire the plague in, in reasonable numbers. Um, it's a gram-negative rod that's acquired uh, from fleas. Uh, that's how you acquire it as a human being. Um, and it comes with a host of really cool pathogen pathogenicity factors um, that or virulence factors that can cause disease. It has a capsule that's made almost entirely out of, of proteins, uh, which makes it kind of hard for your body to recognize. It has some enzymes that it can release that can that can bust blood clots um, that would otherwise cordon the bacteria off so it can cause internal bleeding uh, and, and things like that. Uh, and it also has a system of enzymes that allows it to digest the plasma membrane of your cells. Um, all three of these virulence factors were actually acquired by Yersinia pestis through horizontal gene transfer, uh, which is why HGT is such an important topic to study in the world of bacteria. Without HGT, Yersinia pestis would never have become one of the greatest killers of man in the history of mankind, yet here it is. Another one of the greatest killers of, of, of human beings in, in, in human history is Vibrio cholerae. So Vibrio cholerae is a gram-negative Vibrio. So remember, Vibrio are those bent rods. They kind of look like a comma. Vibrio cholerae is acquired through water. So uh, if you ingest contaminated water, the Vibrio cholerae will colonize your gut. And one of the things that happens in your intestine is it produces something called cholera toxin. Cholera toxin, of course, was acquired through um, HGT. It was actually uh, acquired... Uh, it was acquired through uh, transduction, so the activity of a bacteriophage. This cholera toxin really irritates your body, and it causes your body to try to flush the Vibrio cholera out of your intestine by leaching water into your intestinal lumen. This results in a massive amount of diarrhea. At times, people who are suffering from cholera can shed up to a liter of body fluid per hour as a result, and the diarrhea can be so intense that it results in something called rice water stool. Rice water stool is this stool that has, it looks like rice was cooked in it, so it has this pale white color to it. That's because the person is experiencing such intense diarrhea that they're actually shedding the mucosal lining of their intestine. Of course, Vibrio cholerae will kill you through dehydration if you're not able to be rehydrated to keep up with the vast amount of fluid that you are losing during the infection. Two other gram-negative bacteria that can cause infections in this group are Campylobacter jejuni and Heliobacter pylori. The thing about Campylobacter and, and Heliobacter is they're both spirals. They're considered spirilla. Campylobacter jejuni lives in your intestine, or when you contract it, it lives in your intestine. That's acquired uh, through ingesting food contaminated with Campylobacter. It causes uh, one of the most common cases, one of the most common causes of food poisoning. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, all that good stuff that comes with food poisoning, uh, but probably won't kill you unless you're immunocompromised. Heliobacter pylori, on the other hand, lives in your stomach. It's the cause of peptic ulcers. And the last two members of the Enterobacteria that we'll talk about are actually gram-negative diplococci. So um, that's the pairs of cocci that are uh, conjoined because of uh, they fail to separate during binary fission. So the two most relevant ones here are Neisseria gonorrhoeae, which causes the uh, common sexually transmitted infection uh, gonorrhea. And the other one is Neisseria meningitidis, which is the cause of the most severe form of bacterial meningitis. It's the one that you are actually... Uh, vaccinated against uh, it's also known as the uh, it's also known as meningococcal meningitis if you were to inquire if you were to acquire it 
So all of the species that we just talked about are what we would typically label as true pathogens. Um, the majority of them would never be part of your normal microbiota. Um, there are a couple that might be found in your body on a fairly regular basis uh, and be considered part of your normal microbiota, but could be opportunistic pathogens. Um, the first two are Proteus mirabilis and Proteus vulgaris. So these guys would live in your intestines. Um, and ordinarily they wouldn't be a problem, but uh, if they were to make it into your urinary tract, uh, they could cause uh, UTIs. They're responsible for somewhere around 5% of all UTIs uh, in humans. Um, one really interesting thing about these guys is they have the ability to sort of differentiate their cell types. So some of the cells are what are referred to as swarmer cells. They're heavily flagellated and move quite quickly, while other cells are called swimmer cells, and they move quite slowly. When you look at the way Proteus grows uh, on a Petri dish, you'll actually see it grows in almost a bullseye pattern with radiating circles as they alternate between the swarmer and the swimmer um, phenotype within the population. How they actually exchange between the two is still a, a, re a heavily researched topic. We don't know the answer to how they differentiate between being a swarmer cell and a swimmer cell. The other one is Escherichia coli. So I know when we think about E. coli, we think about E. coli infections and, and the problems that it causes. Understand that you probably have several dozen uh, strains of E. coli in your gut and they're perfectly normal and healthy and happy and part of your normal microbiota and in fact are important for your survival because they aid in your digestion and they aid in the immune health of your gut. Now, if they were to make it out and get into your urinary tract, well, then you would end up with a urinary tract infection. And greater than 90% of all UTIs are caused by normal E. coli from the, from the person's intestine. Now, we do have to be careful about some strains, most notably uh, 0157H7. This is a strain of E. coli that through horizontal gene transfer has acquired a shiga-like toxin that can cause a huge problem. This is the one when you uh, see news stories about people acquiring E. coli uh, from either undercooked meat or getting it from, it seems to be leafy greens lately, uh, people seem to be acquiring this from. Uh, that is typically the 0157H7 variety, and that shiga toxin, again, which was acquired through a horizontal gene transfer, um, that toxin can cause massive damage to your intestine, and it can actually prove fatal um, in some cases. So not all gram-negative guys are bad for you or are even opportunistic pathogens. Um, I want to talk to you quickly about the Bacteroides. So Bacteroides are this really cool group of bacteria. They include species like Bacteroides fragilis, Bacteroides theta iota micron. These are species that live within your gut. They are obligate anaerobes, um, which is why they love living in your gut. But more importantly, they are hugely important for your, your gut health. Um, they help to break down plant toxins, which might otherwise make you sick or harm you. Uh, they help to recycle your bile salts um, so that you don't have to make them fresh every time. And because they help to break down your food, they might be responsible for as much as 15% of your nutritional uh, gain from the food that you eat. So very, very commonly when you take probiotics, you might, you're, you're going to find a species of Bacteroides in there. Keep your Bacteroides levels high. Uh, they're very, very helpful to you. Now, the last two groups we're going to talk about are the spirochetes and the chlamydias. Uh, and what we'll find from both of those is when we talk about them, at least in the context of human disease microbiology, these guys aren't particularly helpful to you. Now, spirochetes are those small, they almost look like springs, um, little corkscrews. Um, they can sometimes be resolved through gram staining. They often, they'll stain gram negative. Um, but because they're so small and so thin, typically we have to observe them through what's called dark field microscopy or we have to use some sort of fluorescence labeling to detect them. Now, in animals like termites or in ruminants like cows, uh, for example, uh, there are some spirochetes that act as gut symbionts. They help to break down the cellulose uh, that these species ingest, or they participate in keeping the gut normal and healthy and happy. In humans, not so much. There are three clinically relevant species that we should talk about. The first one being Treponema pallidum. So Treponema pallidum is the spirochete that causes syphilis, another sexually transmitted infection. Um, there is uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi is the spirochete which is spread by ticks and causes Lyme disease. And I like to stress that it's Lyme disease, not Lyme's disease. It's L-Y-M-E. It's named after Lyme, Connecticut, not after a person named Jerry Lyme. It's not his disease. It's named after a town. Uh, and the other one is leptospiral interrogans. Uh, leptospirosis is an infection that you can acquire. Um, usually you contact it by contacting urine from what's referred to as paradomiciliary animals. Basically things that live around your house that aren't pets. You can acquire it in the wild if you're out hunting, camping, or, or fishing. 
um, and it can cause its infections can range from asymptomatic up to potentially fatal, depending on the severity of the infection. The other group, the chlamydias, uh, have evolved an intracellular lifestyle. Um, they get inside and live inside of your cells. Um, they have almost like a viral like behavior in the fact that when they're outside of cells, they can't really do much until they get inside of another host cell. Two most clinically relevant species within this group are chlamydia trachomatis, which causes the sexually transmitted infection chlamydia, and chlamydia pneumophila, which can cause um, which can cause pneumonia. So to wrap up, today we talked about several different species of bacteria, some of which are harmful to us and cause disease, and others which are helpful to us uh, by producing antibiotics or helping us break down our food and being part of our good, our gut normal microbiota, for example. Remember that the vast majority of bacteria can't harm us because they simply can't grow in our bodies, but there are some that are out there that can cause diseases. I hope you guys learned a lot today and I really appreciate you tuning in and I look forward to seeing you next time.